Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Brown, Executive Director of Special Initiatives at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland College Park. I wanna welcome everyone to the third and final in a series of webinars on safe, fair and full elections that we're holding along with colleagues from the Big Ten Public Policy School Network and other scholars and practitioners from around the country. Today's event entitled Empowering Voters an Accessible and Full Ballot Box follows events in the last two weeks on conducting elections safely during a pandemic and on ensuring the integrity of the ballot box. Video recordings and summaries of these events are available on the School of Public Policy website. And very much along the lines of today's discussion, I'd like to call your attention to another event that we are hosting this Wednesday, October 21st at noon, as part of our Brody Forum series entitled Mobilizing Those Who Matter, a conversation with Nikedra Robinson, founder and CEO of Black Girls Vote. Um, information and a link to register for this event is also available on our website. I wanna thank all of our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. And I'd like to remind everyone that today's event is being recorded and will be shared with all registrants at a later date. A summary of the information shared at this event will be posted on our website as well. Please add any additional questions for the panelists to the chat and we will make sure to address as many of those questions as possible. With that, I'd like to yield to my colleague, Dr. David Bussington, the moderator of today's panel. David? Uh, thanks, Paul, and thank you, everyone, uh, panelists and attendees, for um, convening again for the third in our series of conversations about elections this cycle. Um, before I uh, get started, I want to ask each of our panelists to um, say a few words about themselves, and then I'll sort of give a context for the panel. So, um, Professor Katz, Ellen, if you'd like to lead off, please. Um, just an introduction. Um, thank you um, so much for including me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, I am a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School, where I have been for a number of years now. Um, my work focuses on the Voting Rights Act, the right to vote, election law issues, and issues of equality and equal protection more generally. Thank you. Um, Chris? Yeah, I'm Chris Whitco, and again, uh, I agree. Thanks for having me on here. It's great to be a part of this great panel. And uh, I'm the Associate Director of the School of Public Policy at Penn State. I'm a professor of public policy and political science, and I've done work on voter suppression and then also what the consequences are uh, for policy when certain groups are not voting. Thank you, welcome. Um, and uh, Jonathan, Dr. Alvarado, please. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I'm also the founding director of the Office of Latino Latin American Studies uh, here. And in that I have worked for about the past 15 years on voter mobilization, political participation uh, for new immigrant communities in the Midwest. Thank you. And thank each of you um, for your contributions to our discussion. Um, you know, we're two weeks out from the um, from election day today. Obviously, election or voting has actually started in many jurisdictions already, um, and the news is full of long, long voter lines and various experiences with either voting, lining up, or trying to register to vote. So that's sort of the context that I want to sort of set for the panel before we um, start discussing a, a few questions to focus our focus our attention. Um, you know, the context for this election is both fraught with partisan division, but also fraught with the aftermath of um, legal changes or legal judgments, I suppose, which have altered the context of voting. Um, the 2013 the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that modified the 1965 Voting Rights Act created a different environment than that that existed during the 2008 or 2012 cycles. Um, many have observed that they anticipated at that point a return to more onerous voting conditions for previously disadvantaged groups. Some people think that since then they have seen those concerns validated. Some other people disagree. Um, my perspective on this is that um, the long lines indicate that something is happening, something that we had thought we had perhaps um, gotten over or gotten beyond. Um, Partisan dispute over participation continues, though, and concerns with access to the ballot continue. And that's sort of the context of, that I'd like to bring to the panel. Issues of ballot, of uh, protection of access to the ballot, issues of what 
actually is happening on the ground and what some solutions might be to expanding access to the ballot so that all those with a, who are eligible to vote actually get to fully participate as they choose. And with that, I'd like to ask um, Professor Katz, Ellen, the first question. Um, as follows, I'm gonna try and keep it a little bit to a script so that I actually get the question out. Um, so since the invalidation of key portions of section five of the Voting Rights Act in 2013, many activists have voiced concerns about a return of impediments to access to the ballot um, as states that were previously under the Department of Justice supervision um, are no longer uh, under such supervision. So could you give your take on those concerns and whether they've been validated or invalidated? Sure, um, thanks. Um, so I think in part, yes. Um, so let me, let me just say a few words about what Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act did and what the consequences of Shelby County were for that legal regime. And as you mentioned, this is the provision of the Voting Rights Act from the original statute in 1965. And in many ways, it's the most powerful tool. It applied um, by a, a formula that covered jurisdictions that had a history of um, voter, what we would call today voter suppression, discrimination in voting, low levels of voter registration and turnout. And when a jurisdiction was covered by the statute, several things kicked in. But the key one and the, the element that became inoperative as a result of Shelby County was what was known as the preclearance provision, the section five um, provision. And what that did was it essentially froze in place um, all electoral rules and practices in states and jurisdictions and local jurisdictions that were covered, which meant that if the jurisdiction wanted to change any uh, practice with regard to voting any electoral rule, it needed to obtain um, approval from either the Justice Department or a federal district court. And it needed to demonstrate that the rule, the change would neither have the purpose nor the effect of denying or abridging the right to vote on account of race. And then pursuant to subsequent amendments, language minority status in particular um, populations. Um, and so what it did essentially was shift the burden of proof in from conventional litigation, which requires plaintiffs to come in and prove their case with something of an assumption or a presumption that any change would be discriminatory until it could be shown otherwise. And so among the many things that that provision did over decades, and it was, um, uh, it was enacted as a temporary measure and reauthorized by Congress multiple times, um, was prevent last minute changes to polling places and new hurdles that were put in place, just simply froze it. It was impossible to put them in place and it served as a screen to prevent um, voter suppression ta uh, tactics, um, um, different devices and things that would prevent um, voters from participating on an equal basis. When Shelby County determined that the last reauthorization of this provision was beyond Congress's power, that the formula that Congress was using to subject jurisdictions to these provisions was unconstitutional, it meant that the preclearance requirement no longer, requ uh, no longer applied. And we saw literally within hours of the decision, jurisdictions that had been limited by this provision reenact, implement, resurrect provisions. Texas, North Carolina enacted a new one. Texas resurrected a voter ID measure that had been um, put on hold. And other jurisdictions started putting things in place when this um, shield um, protection um, uh, regulatory device was, was removed. Um, and so we saw in North Carolina, it was an omnibus election law. This was back um, in, the, in the weeks after um, Shelby County, um, new voter ID provisions, but also eliminate, uh, el elimination of all sorts of other same day registration, um, early voting, um, different provisions of that sort that were being used by lots of voters. Right now, and I, I'll, I'll stop in just a moment, um, how credible are the claims now? It's a mixed bag in terms of the degree to which Section 5 would have blocked many of the things that we're seeing um, in connection with this election. So for instance, if you talk about a place like Wisconsin, which we saw one of the earliest um, in this cycle, problems related to voting in a pandemic, the long lines, um, the closure of polling places at the last minute, um, in part due to the inability of Wisconsin to staff those polling, play, uh, polling places, that would have been a change with respect to voting that the um, voting rights that the section five would have covered. And Wisconsin was not a jurisdiction subject to the voting to, the, to that provision in the first instance, so it wouldn't have had any effect there. But last minute changes 
of that sort would have been stopped um, and the jurisdiction would have to come up with some other solution to handle um, their staffing problems. Other problems we've been seeing in connection in the last weeks, months, um, many of the problems with um, absentee ballots, signature matches, witness requirements, things that have become more onerous due to the pandemic, those sorts of things would not have been caught even in covered jurisdictions by Section 5 because they're not changes. Um, and so the last thing I'll say, and I, I apologize for talking too long in this introduction, but I'll just say one more thing. I think one of the larger, broader consequences of, of the Shelby County ruling and the environment that we've been left with is sort of a freeing of language and support for measures that previously folks were less likely to endorse and talk about this way. And I think the rhetoric of our debate and the discussions about fraud and suppression actually themselves function as a vehicle for suppression. So let me stop there because I know there's, I know other folks have lots to say. Hey, thank you for that great, um, great kickoff. And if I can ask you, uh, Dr. Whitka, Chris, um, your response uh, or elaboration or disagreement, if you like. Yeah, um, no. With, with Ellen's intro. I, I appreciate that because I'm far from an expert on Section 5 of the, the Voting Rights Act, so it's nice to have that background. And what I was going to say is if you look at, you know, the last, say, 20, 30 years, I think laws have actually made it much easier to vote in most states. It's actually easier to register. It's easier, you know, going back to the 90s with motor voter and things like that. And even in a lot of the states we talk about, North Carolina, I mean, they have early voting and things like that, which they wouldn't have had 40 years ago. So in some ways it's become much easier to vote. I think where the, the action, I mean, the voter ID laws are a, are a kind of a thing that's been happening that's uh, against that trend. Um, and those have been enacted in a number of states in the last 15, 20 years. I think in the political science research on whether those actually reduce voting, it's not clear that they do actually. I think a lot where the action is, is in these kind of administrative decisions made by kind of governors on the fly, made by local county boards of election to put polling places in, in some places or, oh, look, we have budget cuts. We need to reduce the number of polling places. Where those polling places get reduced is not, you know, it's, it's not just a, a random thing, right? It tends to be reduced in places where people of color are living um, not, you know, white suburban areas typically. Um, think about the governor of Texas, his decision to limit uh, mail, mail in ballot drop off places to one per county, right? It's, it's these types of decisions, I think, more so than legislation that's actually, it, it's very hard to know exactly the effect of these things on voter turnout and voting rates and things like that because it's extremely difficult to measure these things. But these are the types of decisions that I think are really affecting people. When you see the early voting lines, eight, nine hours the other day in, in Georgia, um, maybe that didn't actually discourage anyone from voting. Maybe people are so determined to vote, they're gonna, they're gonna go through it anyway. But, but even if they decide to vote, it's still not fair that some people have to spend nine hours in line voting and other people can go and, and vote in 20 minutes in and out. So I think, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are. The laws in general have, be, have made it easier to vote, but there's a lot of these local level and state level administrative decisions that are putting burdens on people um, and making it harder to vote, uh, purging the rolls, for instance, in places like Ohio, just things like that, which are a little less visible than voter ID laws, which get a lot of attention and are really easy to observe when a legislature passes those. There's a lot of these other types of decisions that are putting burdens on people. And I think that that's where a lot of the problems are that we're seeing this year and, and in recent years. And I don't know, uh, Professor Katz maybe could answer this, but like, as far as if there's budget cuts in a county board of election says we got to reduce our budget and we have to eliminate polling places, would that type of thing have been subject to Section 5 in the past, like, like even an administrative decision like that? Okay, if I just jump in here, David. Please do, please do. Yeah, it, in a place okay. that has been subject to the statute, certainly. Right. Um, administrative decisions, let the state legislature down to local boards, and that was part of the, the power. Yeah. 
of it. So. And I think one thing about that decision, maybe as much as anything else, is I think it just signaled to the states and put people within the states that, you know, if, you, if it, something does get litigated and it does wind up in the courts and it does go to the Supreme Court, you're going to have a good chance of winning, even if you're preventing people from voting. Well, good observations. Um, so administrative um, restrictions and patterns of behavior not um, per se um, legal uh, obstructions um, as, a, as a trend. Uh, Dr. Alvarado, um, do you agree that that's sort of the evolution of uh, restrictions? But, as well, actually, I, I want to kind of divert just a little bit here and give us a real time kind of case study, because I think that this is really germane to the discussion that we're having right now. And I'll focus on Harris County in Texas, the uh, Houston metropolitan area, because for me, this is a this is a case study of, of really raw politics and a partisan effort that has been in place and ongoing now in Texas for a few months of a very partisan effort to manipulate voter turnout. Um, the Republican leaders in the state and activists have worked furiously, I'm gonna argue, um, you know, the levers of power and they've churned out lawsuits and they have unsubstantiated specters of voter fraud and official state orders to limit voter options during the pandemic. And their power has actually stemmed uh, state officials in a lot of areas but the, under the leadership of Judge Lena Hidalgo in the Harris County, the Harris County party and the Democrats have launched a very robust effort to make voting as easy as possible. They've tripled the number of early voting and election day polling locations. They've increased the budget in the county from $4 million to $30 million um, in a, in a four-year period. And they have rejected all the claims on the part of the Republican party uh, to make voting easier, that it carries any kind of inherent risk for fraud or, or widespread voter kind of you know, manipulation. But what's interesting about it, 100,000 people voted in Harris County on Friday. Uh, they, have have, they have over two and a half million people registered to vote, which is uh, uh, five, almost 250,000 more than in 2016. Um, and already 20% of the population in Harris County has voted, you know, and so it's trending very positively in spite of the effort that's been put in place. And, and we're aware of all the machinations that are happening uh, in the state of Texas, but I find that to be very interesting. And like I said, I'm sure this will be the grist of many doctoral dissertations in the future for what Harris County has undertaken, but I think it's a great example of in the absence of, of uh, legal protection that elected officials have undertaken that responsibility and obligation to advance it on their own. That's an interesting perspective. Um, and it sort of leads into where sort of I'd like to hear some comments on sort of the countermeasures that groups in society and that perhaps uh, um, attorneys uh, in this space have put in place post um, 2013. Um, obviously, there are people who are interested in mobilizing voters um, who have seen impediments but have tried to um, overcome them. We had higher turnouts in Wisconsin during the primary season than we might have expected also um, in, a, in an area where some of the administrative rules have been put in place that, may, that are seen by some as impeding access to the ballot. So, so in a sense, you know, the question is, post-2013, are there more you know, is ballot access impeded more than it would have been otherwise, um, more generally? And, and how effective are the countermeasures by those who want to mobilize voters? Harris County is a good example. Um, anyone uh, first, please. Well, I can jump in here. I think, um, you know, there are <clears throat> unprecedented attempts, well, not unprecedented, but uh, renewed attempts to, you know, restrict voting. There's, there's a certain dynamic that people have been looking at there. I mean, if you try to restrict people's voting, one thing that can happen is it can make voting even more salient, right? It can make, wow, these people are trying to abridge my right to vote. That kind of gets me mad. I'm gonna make damn sure I vote this year. So that's one dynamic that happens even absent efforts at mobilization. But then you heard the, uh, the things that are happening. Jonathan discussed Harris County, Texas, but there's a lot of efforts like that throughout the uh, 
country. There's a, I mean, I'm in Pennsylvania, which is a swing state, and I'm getting multiple phone calls, multiple texts now. That's a new thing, right? Every, every day telling me, here's how you get your, I mean, now we're past the point of where you can request your mail-in ballot, but I was getting texts about, here's where you can get your mail-in ballot, and then here's where you can drop off your ballot, and I'm getting texts saying, well, it looks like you received your mail-in ballot. Now, here's places where, you know, I don't, I guess they can go on the Secretary of State's website. And actually, I have to say, I found it extremely helpful. I mean, I have a PhD in political science, but it was really nice to get a text with a link that, okay, here's where I can go drop off my mail-in ballot. So if other people are getting that type of, those types of texts and battlegrounds, and from what I hear they are, it's, it's, it's helpful. I mean, for me, it was helpful. So I would imagine for a less informed voter, it would be even more helpful. So there, there's a lot of efforts to mobilize people. And uh, I mean, based on what we see with the early voting numbers, it, it seems to be working. It'll remain to be seen whether these people are just going to vote now and there's just going to be fewer voters on election day. But it looks like there's going to be a really big turnout this year. So we'll see. Um, Ellen, please go ahead. Sure. So let me, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I think, I think one of the things we're seeing um, is that um, conventional litigation is actually not going to be, at least in federal court, a way to vindicate voting rights in an effective way, or perhaps the most effective way in this election. And that it is the sort of grassroots mobilization, ensuring people are registered, ensuring people mm -hmm. know how to pass their ballots that are, that, that's going to make um, a difference here. The, 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 the measures Jonathan just described in um, Harris County, the efforts of local people to ensure voters get out and, and cast their ballots. Um, here in Michigan, where I am, in 2018, we amended our, our state constitution to make it easier to vote in a whole bunch of ways, absentee ballots on demand, same day registration, um, things of that sort. Um, that make a difference in this in this election now um, for reasons that actually were not even anticipated at the end. So I think state court, state law is a way to go. Um, and other rules about motor voter, voter purge and the like um, are not gonna be met with a receptive audience. And we've seen that in multiple cases around the country um, mm -hmm. right now. Um, and so we're waiting to see, um, you know, exactly how this is going to play out and the role the courts are going to play. But I do think that's going to be the place where we're going to see a massive expansion and participation. Um, Jonathan, uh, any comments on, on this particular? Well, you know, I'm actually, I feel very secure here in Nebraska because of <coughs> just, we have a very robust uh, system. The Secretary of State down to the county election commissioners who are appointed um, by the, by the state um, really do uphold that obligation. Um, I actually have to tell you that assuages most of my concerns as to whether or not votes will be counted appropriately ac inaccurately here in Nebraska. I can't say that for the rest of the country, but I would venture to say from, a, from an academic perspective that most you know, public officials adhere to the same standards. I think that they do, or that they are by and large ethical and do you know, strive to provide um, that service and to, to all citizens. And so um, at the end of the day, I'm still hopeful in spite of all the chicanery and, and machinations that are going on behind the scenes to suppress votes. And so um, in that regard, especially knowing that already 28 million people have voted as of this morning uh, nationally, uh, that, that the, the system is robust. Okay, um, on that optimistic note, let me, um point to some recommendations to enhance, to sort of accentuate the positive here. What are some positive lessons from the successful mobilization of voters this time to the extent that we can call that an interim conclusion? Um, in spite of what some cited as a, a perhaps more onerous legal environment. Um, so what's your top two, one or two um, positive, um, well, let, me, let me change that a little bit. If we have um, voting at a higher level than perhaps was anticipated by some due to concern with voter suppression, what are the two or three recommendations you'd make to reaffirm that trend in the future? Uh, to make sure that access to the ballot is um, more free and more um, consistent across different jurisdictions. Uh, starting with you, Chris, please. 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, even if people do overcome the hurdles and wait in line and, and you know, figure out where their mail-in ballot can be dropped off and all this stuff, there's no question that in the U.S. voting is really burdensome compared to most other, you know, developed democracies. So we should really be trying to make it easier for even easier than it is in some states for people to vote. You know, when you see people waiting in line for nine hours to vote, that that's just absolutely unacceptable. That should never happen in a democracy. There's no reason for it. And there's no reason to have it persist, except it's a choice. I mean, it's an absolute choice that jurisdictions are making to, to have that happen. Um, you know, your your guy in Maryland, John Sarbanes, has, has sponsored uh, HR1, which is something I know the Democrats want to pursue if they can get a Democratic Senate, which would be a bill that would expand voting rights in a lot of ways. And I was looking over that bill, and it's a very good bill. I don't know if it gets down into the weeds enough to do things like guarantee a certain amount of polling places per capita and things like that. It does a lot in terms of registration, in terms of making those things easier. But I think we need even a more robust system of federal funding to the states and localities to ensure adequate polling places and, and things like that. So, I mean, the standard should be the, what a white upper class person in the suburbs has in terms of the voting experience. That should be the voting experience that everybody in America has. And it should be better for everyone. And there's ways to do that. States are doing a lot, but we, we are going to need a national standard because, and national funding for some of this stuff, because there are jurisdictions that don't have resources and there are jurisdictions that do want to suppress voting. So until we have a national standard, unfortunately, there are going to be places where there's just going to be very divergent experiences of voting and access to the ballot for different racial, ethnic, economic groups. Um, Ellen, if you'd like to respond next. Yeah, I agree with I agree with all that. I mean, we do have laws already that are meant to get at some of this. Section two of the Voting Rights Act is still in place, and it bans practices that have racially dis uh, disparate impacts or results in a denial of the right to vote or an infringement of the right to vote on account of race and again the language minority statuses. So I, I mean, I agree with everything Chris just said. I'm I'm less optimistic than Jonathan, I should say, on the status of you know what what's going on. I agree that the lines are for are, are impossible um, and. Um, while as a sign of the commitment of the voters who are standing in them, nothing, and they are not something people should be subjected to, um, and are clearly a form of voter suppression. And I think our decentralized voting process allows um, lots of the, lots of election officials are acting in good faith and doing their best, but there are those that are not, and some of those are our folks at the state level who are implementing obstacles and putting in obstacles for the purpose of suppressing the vote. So I agree, HR one is a great way to go. Um, we are um, going to encounter problems about congressional power um, on every on some of the components in there. Congress's power to regulate federal elections is um, arguably more robust than some of its ability to impose some of these rules on state and local elections. Not, um, and we'll still see it on state and local elections. But I do think um, you know there is a role for Congress here to make um, the substantive law more robust and take some of the discretion away from local officials who are um, making it harder for people to vote. Okay, and before I ask uh, Dr. Alvarez to continue on that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Thomas um, from our School of Public Health. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I finally found all the right links. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate how difficult that is this morning. <laughs> uh, so um, if you'll bear with me for a second, Dr. Thomas, I have a specific uh, concern I'd like to raise regarding um, participation. But first, uh, Dr. Alvarez, would you like to just complete the... Yeah, um, so I'm just going to continue. I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with, with uh, both, both Ellen and Chris on this, is that we do have to have a, a um, some sort of a standard to ensure, and I think if it's, we can say the suburban standard, is, is the standard that we should have for, for all voters in terms of access to, to polling places so that there isn't seven and eight hour waits for lines. And, you know, actually that's a testimony to, to um, the willingness of, of citizens to, to make sure that their vote is cast, but um, it's, it's also borders on, on criminal, to be honest with you. And so I would agree, agree with that uh, completely. And I think that we really have to kind of push 
nationally, and it's going to have to come through Congress. I agree with that as well, that some measure has to be enacted to ensure that everyone has equal access to the polls. You know, um, so I'll leave it at that, because I think that uh, that in and of itself is a very powerful statement. Uh, thank you. And on that uh, consensus note, uh, Dr. Thomas, welcome. And a specific question to you, to we've all, we sort of had implicit um, consensus here, I guess, on the context, the conditions confronting the polls in 2020. But I guess I'd like to hear from you directly on how you characterize this current administration's um, approach and perspective on access to the ballot. I mean, we all have opinions, but uh, I'd like to hear your your sort of expert opinion from the perspective of someone who's involved in a minority community turnout and mobilization. So how do you see things? Well, um, let me start with my set, my background setting. <laughs> barbershop. <laughs> a black barbershop. And for, uh, uh, for Chris and David and me, it doesn't matter how much hair you have, no self-respect in black barber would ever say, I get you in and out in 15 minutes, okay? <laughs> so it's a place where men and women, depending on their hairstyle, actually talk to one another in a trusted setting. And here's what I'm hearing, my friend. Folks are fired up. Folks are fired up. They know that the barriers are put in place to try to silence their voices. And they're going to persist but for some of them to persist means losing money. Why should they stand eight hours in a line? And for these guys, if they're not cutting hair, they're not feeding their families. So that's the tension that we have. So from where I'm sitting, it's convincing them that their vote matters. Once people realize their vote matters, they will crawl to the polls. And so I'm hearing less, uh, David, I'm hearing less of this, my vote doesn't matter. My, my vote doesn't count. I heard more of that in 2016, less of that now. But that motivation that that does count means huge hurdles that they have to overcome. So the last thing we want is for them to go through the motions, go through the, the sacrifice, and then put their ballot in a fake box. That should be a crime to go through all they're doing filling out their absentee ballot and get there. And it says, you don't have two witnesses. Come on, that's like counting the jelly beans in a jar, right? We know how this thing works. I think we need to show them examples of what voter suppression looked like back in the 1930s during Jim Crow. This is what your great grandparents had to go through so that you can actually vote. And so we need to give them a reason to realize their vote matters. And whenever anyone says, my vote doesn't count, let's sit down with them and let them know how things changed once people like them had the right to vote. The world changed. We need to let them know that it still can change now by their participation and, and, and not get caught up into that they don't count or don't matter. Now, once you do that, they need a plan. I've run into people that, okay, once I've got them going, okay, well, where do I sign up? Where's my polling station? All that has to be at my fingertips right then. Now I got my teachable moment, Ellen. They wanna know where do I go? What do I need to take with me? And we have to have that right there. I think the barbershop should be a place where people can not only register to vote, but get all the information they need about where to vote. But more important than that, I'd love to hand them a brochure or something other than like the US Constitution that says, here's why you should vote. Here's why your vote counts. So if there's any materials like that, we need a mail. Celebrities don't matter. They want to know Joe on the street, the, the, you know, the wisdom of the common man and woman. That's what they want. They do not see themselves reflected in celebrities. Um, sports stars or any of that. And I'm glad that they're out there, but they wanna hear from everyday people. So I'd love to have some folks in the barbershop who voted early, you know, and who filled out their absentee and hang out in the barbershop and talk about it. And David, you know, that could work. Now, Jonathan and Chris, I just want you to know there's no super cuts or hair cutlery in the black community. <laughs> 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 Nobody's in and out in 15 minutes, okay? 
So you got the time to build relationships. And I think it's been a neglected space. We know that the churches have been a space that we've gone to traditionally, but we've left out this space. And this is where those, you know, 20 to 45 year old men who don't feel they're being courted by anybody, by marketing or business, feeling left out, that's where we reach them. We reach them where they already come for trusted services. I'm intrigued by that, that response, and it's one that I have sort of resonate with, especially with the barber part. <laughs> <laughs> How about the administration, though? I mean, is the administration welcoming this sort of potential mobilization within um, the Black community, or is it sort of indifferent or hostile, or how do you see that? Well, yeah, I'll give you some wisdom from the streets. They say things like, plants don't grow unless they have resistance. And they recognize that the resistance being put up right now in, in ways that are as blatant as they were in Jim Crow era, and we've not seen it this blatant, they recognize it is designed to stop them and people like them from thinking their vote matters and from showing up. I think that we simply need to help them with the logistics. Okay. And in these spaces, we cannot let those spaces, the barbershops and the salons be spaces where the, the prevailing conversation is your vote doesn't matter. Uh, the parties are just the same. That cannot be the prevailing conversation. And in our absence, that's what's flowing out there, spewing out there. The counterbalance is not there. I don't know why, but I do believe that we need a very aggressive way of getting into these kinds of spaces where people are being missed and where misinformation is flowing like a cesspool. So you raise an interesting issue there about misinformation, which is sort of a segue to another, another sort of element, I think, of the notion of a fair and full participation um, in elections. How about disinformation on social media or on mainstream media relative to uh, election dynamics, mobilization, uh, the common place observation in 2016 was that the media fixated on certain issues and didn't cover other ones. Um, similar problem this cycle. Um, Jonathan, you first. Yeah, very much so. Actually, I'll give you another example. Um, Southern Florida, um, a large Latino population. And, and, you know, we it's well known in the Latino communities that uh, in Spanish speaking folks and immigrants use WhatsApp um, for, for communication because it's a uh, it's voice over internet provider. It's not a telephone, so they don't have to pay all these exorbitant calls costs when they're calling their friends. But it's the main point of communication for so many folks in these communications. And what we're seeing is a disinformation campaign around the idea of, of Catholicism, which is kind of really crazy for me to, to think about it, is that you cannot be a good, you cannot be a Democrat and be a good Catholic, is some of the messaging that's going out. Um, and I know there was some media reporting on this recently, and that basically, um, or that when candidate Biden went to the Haitian community in Miami, um, it was uh, saying that he was meeting with foreign nationals and conspiring against, and this is like I said, actual things are being distri distributed through that media. But what's interesting is that there has been a counterbalance with advocacy groups in the Latino community, but uh, and, and African American community as well, Win Black and Palante and Voto Latino, they're saying that this is outright um, voter suppression, and they are are standing up and identifying. And so they're using their media platforms to kind of counterbalance. It's a lot of he said, she said type of thing going on, but this is actually happening, and it's something that uh, I want. I think people should be aware of it. You know, and it and it, and even the signaling that's based on race has gone from a dog whistle to a bullhorn. Right. You know? <laughs> no, it really has. I mean, the, the president has spared no, no effort and no expense to, to really kind of vilify communities of color. And I think that that, that should be, you know, stated up front. Uh, he's, you know, made a very overt effort to block people from casting their ballots. If it's the claims of voter fraud, you know, uh, can, you know, ballots being found in the dumpster or that he won't fund the post office. And then it, that it really constitutes a very widespread campaign of voter intimidation. But to Stephen's point, 
people are cognizant, they're aware, and they say, oh, oh, no, you're not. You're not going to get away with this. And so I find that to be very compelling in the face of what in the past may have dissuaded many people from actually taking the effort up to vote. And so, like I said, this remains to be seen. If this will definitely impact both the turnout and then how votes are counted. Um, Ellen, would you care to comment on this misinformation as a mobilizer or demobilizer, as the case may be? Right. Um, so we've seen, you know, a lot of this um, in Michigan. Um, our attorney general has actually brought charges against a robocall effort in which the calls were stating false claims about use mail and ballots, your information is going to be used to come after you for old warrants, old debts, um, and even and the, the, the specific case involved mandatory vaccines. I mean, outrageous false comments. And so we see an effort to prosecute there. But I think it's still, you know, it's still a tremendous problem because lots of disinformation falls on one side or another of the First Amendment. You know, there's, there's a line between active false statements, threats, and the like, and the kinds of statements that are exaggerations or simply discourage people from participating. And it's very difficult, and I think technology and social media make it much harder to combat um, efforts to suppress the vote through those types of um, effort, just those types of efforts, because it's it, you can't get you. They're, they're targeted, micro targeted in many places, um, and it, it's difficult. And I guess I just I I am encouraged that by by the, several of the statements regarding, hey, it's great. People are not allowing this to discourage them. You're going to tell me I can't vote. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to wait in the line, and I'm going to make sure I cast my ballot. On the one hand, yes, that is encouraging. On, an, on the other though, people should not be forced into that position and they should not be, not just the waiting online, but it should be that we can engage and participate, not because someone's trying to steal it from us. Um, and I, I, do, I do find it, you know, just to, to say something, you know, banal, worrisome. Um, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely worrisome. Mm -hmm. But um, Ellen, may I, may I, David, may I ask Ellen a question? Please, so, please, so, so please. Ellen, please. Ellen um, I hear exactly what you're saying. And in 2016, we're, we were saying some of the same things. I'm trying to figure out, why are we here again? Why, why are we seeing things like uh, uh, polling places closing at 5 o'clock? 250 people in line, and they say, oh, we're closing at 5. I guess my point is, right now, we have to... This is the reality we have in front of us. But if we didn't make any of big structural changes from 2016 to now, is that because it's all controlled at the local level? I mean, why are we finding ourselves with the same things we've argued against in the past facing us again right now? Because for some of these people, once they get there, they're in line for eight hours and they get up to that and they say, okay, show me your ID and they say it's not the right ID, now we're ready to fight. Okay, now we're really angry. And we got to figure out how to avoid that kind of frustration once people make that commitment to give their time. So help me. <laughs> we need better law. I mean, you know, in some ways, I do think like the law has changed and the, um, the protections that both federal law and federal courts once accorded uh, voting rights claims, um, it's not there anymore. And you know, you can trace this over more than a decade of decisions mm -hmm. that have narrowed the construction of existing federal protections under the Voting Rights Act, but also just under the constitution and how we understand what it means to impose an undue burden on the right to vote, which is the constitutional standard for decades. And we have seen in recent years and since the last election, frankly, a change in the federal courts and the ability of federal courts or the willingness of federal courts, Supreme Court, mm -hmm. um, to enforce a robust conception of the right to vote. And that is a big problem because there's, mm -hmm. you know, at some point there is a limit to what local officials can do and there's a limit to what can be done to stop local officials who are inclined to not mm -hmm. a, um, a robust conception. And sometimes those local officials are the governors and you know state level officials who are imposing you know very serious obstacles. So it's not an encouraging 
um, moment. Um, and I would like to see the law do a lot better than it's doing. Well, when the Republican Party in Texas, I think it was Texas, put up these ballot boxes and made them look like they were official ballot boxes, but they weren't. I believe that's California. That was California. Oh, that, of all places, California, <laughs> that, uh, that those boxes are still there. And they said that the law allowed them to collect ballots and they were just doing that, collecting ballots and then going to turn them in. That gave me a lot of pause, Ellen. I didn't like that at all. You're in good company. You're not like <laughs> well, a, a little bit of good news there. I know that Secretary of State Alex Padilla has issued a cease and desist order for the use of those boxes. And I know that the state attorney general is, was, is prepared to, to press charges against the state GOP. But I mean, the, the depth that people will go to to suppress other people's right to vote, you know, it's there. It's, it's really transparent now. We don't need to have any more evidence than, than that. Then there's an overt effort to, to make sure that some people don't get their vote counted. And on that point, let me allow Chris to, Chris to yeah. uh, say his piece on what this. What I was going to say is, I mean, and, and unfortunately, I think you're going to see as much or more of this in the next, you know, 10 years or so. Because the reason, and, and let's just be clear, I mean, there's one party that wants to prevent people from voting, and that's the Republican Party, right? It's not the Democrats who are trying to prevent people from voting. And there's a, a bunch of reasons why this has really become a more, you know, usual thing for Republicans to try to do. I mean, we're, there's incredible polarization between the parties. So the stakes of winning and losing are much higher than they were in, say, the 70s or 80s, where the parties were much closer in policy. There's a lot more competition in many states. You know, there was no competition for decades in the South. And then, you know, when we switched from the kind of Democratic dominance in the South. Then for a little while, you had Republicans completely dominant, at least in statewide elections. And now you're seeing states like Georgia and even Texas this year being competitive. I mean, if, if Texas wasn't competitive, there would be absolutely no reason to try to suppress the voting of, of Democrats, which is what they're trying to do. The other thing we've seen in the last 20, 30, 40 years is minority groups African Americans and now increasingly Hispanics are becoming more aligned with the Democratic Party. Whereas through the 70s, you still had a pretty decent number of African Americans who were Republicans. So it wouldn't have made as much sense at that time to try to suppress voting by blacks. And now it's like, you know, blacks are 90, 95% Democrats. So you know if you're a Republican in Texas or Georgia and you prevent black people from voting, you're preventing Democrats from voting. And you know those trends aren't going to reverse themselves, and so I think this is something we're with. I mean, it, it's happening because it's a it's an attractive thing for the Republican Party to do. Another alternative would be to put forth policies that are actually popular and that could actually attract the support of minority voters. And you know, like th that's that's really the fundamental. That's a pretty thing. revolutionary statement, there, Chris. No, if you read, <laughs> uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, who are political scientists, have a very good book on this. But the Republican Party has quite unpopular economic policy, uh, you know, preferences, and that's really the root of this. So if they run on the economy and things, they're going to have a hard time winning. So they could put forth more popular policies, but they it appears that they're not going to do that at this at this time. So I would expect to see more attempts to suppress voting. And you know, even if HR1 passes and some of these things happen, it's not that incentive isn't going to go away. So we're going to still need the grassroots mobilization. We're going to still need, as, as Stephen says, things happening in barbershops, salons, and other types of you know, locations in other types of communities where people can get the word out there and counter this disinformation. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were saying, alluded to a minute ago, one thing about when people are coming out and trying to suppress your vote, one thing it says to you is, wow, my vote is really important. <laughs> yeah. they, they don't want me to vote. That, it must be like, it must mean something, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so we, we all need, I mean, those of us who want more voting and widespread voting, we need to, um, you know, we need to build on that. So on that, on that score, um... Let's try and be a little bit forward leaning and say, if there are legislative changes that could allow safe, secure, high integrity voting to take place at a higher level, 
what's on your list? What's on your list of recommended changes that you would like to see made irrespective of the outcome um, in two weeks? Um, Jonathan, first, please. Well, what, I, what would I like to see? Well, I, I, you know, I think from my perspective, and, and I've said this for a very long time, especially as it, it relates specifically to Latinos as members of the American uh, democracy and political system, is that by and large, they're very conservative. And if the Republican Party were to play the old, you know, Republican values of family and church and those types of things, they, they probably could have done a more robust job of attracting Latino voters, as opposed to hitting them over the head with these, you know, very ham-fisted efforts to, to vilify, intimidate, and marginalize them. And so my hope is that we would get a much more honest assessment, um, but unless it's based in race, which I think that it is, I'm not, you know, I'm not going out on a limb on that. Um, I, I could foresee that there would perhaps be a, a permanent democratic majority in this country. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is the black and Latinos, but South Asians are becoming very politically sophisticated. These are not just grassroots movements, they're grass tops movements also. You know, they're being led by folks who have gone to schools of public policy and they've gone to law school and they know how to do this stuff. They know how the, how the wheels uh, are, are, are greased. And so um, that is not lost on me at all. And let's just have it honestly. And I think that if Republican party is able to stand up and, and change its policies as, as Chris has suggested, that they might have, it might resonate more with, with a broader base of voters. But the fact is that they've chosen a very narrow swath and they've been doing this now for about 30 years. They're limiting their opportunities. So I'll just leave it at that. So that sort of speaks to the demography of if you want to succeed, perhaps you need to act consistent with the way the country is changing. Uh, Helen, in terms of that or a more specific legislative change, what kind of things would you think would be steps forward, I suppose? Yeah, um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm I, I mean, I'm a lawyer, so I guess I think, you know, we need stronger laws. Um, and I think the effort, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the things that Chris just mentioned in his, his earlier comment, go back to the 70s and the 80s, less polarization. I'm not sure I, I, I subscribe to quite the same narrative. I think there have been relentless efforts at voter suppression um, for, you know, well more than a century now. And um, what, you know, the, the existence, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record here, the, the Voting Rights Act, you know, stopped some of that quite effectively. Um, and it didn't stop it entirely. It pushed it and we had fights over districting. We had fights over other other efforts um, and the Voting Rights Act and related constitutional provisions and other provisions, I think helped, certainly it was no golden you know, era of you know, golden age of voter participation, but I think the removal of some of those tools um, are part of the story that everyone has been telling about the problems that we've been um, facing. So, um, and I do think there's a limit to what folks on the ground can accomplish if the law is so unfavorable. So if you could take a look at something like what's happened in Florida, 2018, we saw voters come together and say, let's amend our constitution and let people with criminal records vote about time. Um, and that provision is, is, is made into the constitution. And you know, more than a million people were anticipated to be, you know, able to register for the first time in Florida for, a, a, you know, and, and what followed is a disaster from my vantage point. The legislature comes in and says, you have to pay off your legal financial obligations. There's been endless litigation is that in, you know, in federal court. And to the, you know, my understanding is like at this point, it has been wholly unsuccessful. The number of people who have been able to successfully register, and we can talk more about the, the intricacies of that litigation and what, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals just did in September mm -hmm. to prevent, um, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people from registering who would have been been eligible under this. And it's a complicated story. But even the ability to get a state as large as Florida to get 65% of voters, I think, supported the, the amendment there. Um, and to see the outcome now two years later, it's not the end of the story. There will still be efforts to get folks registered, to pay off these debts, to try and work it out. But there was a district court ruling a year ago. There was a district court, a second ruling in the spring um, that should have struck this down under a conception of what 
I think the right to vote should have been an, a, an understanding of what Florida was up to in imposing or trying to enforce these fines. And again, it's just one area and one issue, but I do think it's, it's not a happy story mm -hmm. about the ability of grassroots mobilization to really push back against a very narrow conception of what voting is and the sense that the federal courts are gonna help at all. And let me just add, sorry, I'm going on too long, but just to add, you know, the federal courts are what saved us back in 1965 and you know by upholding the Voting Rights Act and even before that with the early decisions that began to say we do need this inter intervention to make sure that the political process, the electoral process is open in a way that it wasn't. Um, and, and we don't see that anymore and it's not gonna be that way for a long time, I suspect. Um, and on that, uh, on that note, uh, Chris, um, your um, preferred changes, legislative or mass mobilization or political that make our system a little bit more tractable. Yeah, and excuse me if you hear my dog over here, but um, I agree laws are very important and I didn't mean to say they weren't, but um, you know, there's a reason why these, these suppression tactics are increasing and having weak laws is part of that. So I do think HR1 is a really good start if if Democrats do win both houses of Congress and the presidency, they would be able to do that. Um, of course, with the way the Supreme Court is, and as Ellen said, some of these, just where the rights uh, of Congress to regulate state and local voting practice begin and end is not entirely clear. So you have to worry about a little bit about when these get challenged by the states and they will be, um, you know, what's the Supreme Court gonna do? So bar, you know, in the meantime, we need to have multiple tracks. We need to be thinking about laws, but we also need, need to be thinking about the grassroots mobilization. And I'll stop there because my dog wants to play. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Thomas, um, Stephen, how, what's your take? Well, I think we should have a national election holiday so that like Christmas, Thanksgiving, you call it whatever you want. On that day, that is our civic duty. That's our civic responsibility. And on that day, we remove as many barriers as possible to voting, like getting to the polls. But Ellen, you know, what you said was so sobering to me because there are 36 states that have identification requirements at the polls. Seven states have strict photo ID laws under which voters must present one of a limited number of forms of government ID in order to cast a regular ballot, ballot, no exceptions. Those were laws passed. So my question is, how is it when these voter restriction laws come up on these ballot initiatives, they pass? Are we on the ground? And, and, and uh, listen, I'm looking in the mirror myself because when those things happen, sometimes I'm behind the curve and I don't know I need to fight hard to make sure that I know what voting yes or voting no means on those ballot initiatives. Sometimes they're presented in a way that sounds like people who look like me, people who think like us might vote yes, and it's actually a suppression. So I don't know if that happens in the midterms or where those things are happening, but I, I think we're behind the curve. So my simplistic response, you know, because we have to have battle troops and logistics and generals to help us sort that out because it's going to be a ground fight jurisdiction by jurisdiction. But how do we get a national civic responsibility voter holiday? How do we get that? What would that take? Has that ever been issued? Maybe there's legislation that never got traction. It's all written up. That's actually part of HR1, if I remember, So, which is uh, sponsored by John Sarbanes of Maryland. Actually. So what's the, what's the whole title of HR1? Oh, uh, I forget. Anyway, you can Google <laughs> HR1, John Sarbanes, and you'll see it. And I believe one of the provisions in there is to make Election Day a national holiday. I can get my people behind that. I mean, we also can expand early voting and in some ways, you know, not just mail-in voting, but early voting and the ability to, you don't need a specific day if we vote over a course of several weeks and it's easy and possible um, to do that. And some people, um, I mean, some of the voter ID, some of a measure, some of the obstacles we've seen have been done by ballot initiative. Some of them are adopted by state legislatures that have been gerrymandered. Um, or that are otherwise not necessarily reflective of what everybody thinks. Um, there isn't consensus 
there is a sense if you just look at something like voter ID that people, people, yeah, why shouldn't you have to show an ID? And, you know, you hear that from lots of judges along the way, as we've seen those cases be litigated, who doesn't have an ID? Turns out a lot of people don't have an ID. And again, not to, you know, I'll just, you know, beat this horse you know, that we could understand the constitutional right to vote to be um, burdened by the way certain voter ID laws operate. We could understand certain voter ID laws to have a racially disparate impact or racially disparate result within the meaning of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so, you know, so on and so forth. So there, there are ways that laws could be enforced. HR1 could come in and make it harder to enact, harder to display some of these practices, but, um, um, it's, it, I, I don't think it's just a mistake like, oh, I missed that ballot initiative and I voted the wrong way that, that's causing that. So just as I, to draw a somewhat um, pessimistic um, <laughs> uh, summary, summary of what we've just heard, is it fair to say that the federal courts are unlikely to be um, a progressive in the usual sense, um, protection against uh, access against restrictions on ballot access and that if it's not the federal courts then perhaps it's at the state level and it's just elections that the political branch is aware this is a, this is going to be fought. Um, is that a consensus? Chris go ahead. Yeah I think I think I mean certainly it seems like in the short term at least obviously it depends on the state and on districts in you know the federal district courts vary in terms of ideological composition of the judges but uh certainly at the supreme court level it looks like we're gonna have a pretty conservative group of justices uh you know for the foreseeable future you know there is some political science research showing where that judges will go along with the elected branches and public opinion to some degree so i think we'll be maybe testing that theory in a lot of different areas not just voting rights in the coming years but also economic issues and other other issues. You know, Chris, you said back in the 70s when we were less polarized, you know, even black folks were Republican. I just want to tell you, you're absolutely right, because my father was one, okay? <laughs> and so now we've seen what has happened. What I don't understand is how these blatant efforts to restrict people from voting get upheld in the court. I mean, in other words, when they're upheld in the court, is it upheld, yes, we want to restrict these people from voting, or is it upheld because that local jurisdiction does have the right to decide where ballot boxes are? I mean, it's something very benign that still has the negative output. What, what, what is it so that we know how to develop the advocacy? I mean, if I could jump in there, I mean, I think there are there are infinite ways to structure an election. Um, and you know, how many hours should the polling place be open? How many ballot boxes are enough? How long is it too long to wait in line? And I think what you're at least seeing in the federal courts right now as you know, in the last several months, but longer than that, um, a sense that these are decisions for states. Um, these are not decisions that the federal constitution speaks to or that federal law speaks to in the, in the array of choices. And I'm just going to add like to a little bit even more pessimistic, um, not to be even further, <laughs> further than I've already been, but there's a case now pending in the Supreme Court and we've been waiting now for since late September from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in which the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that voters in Pennsylvania ought to have um, a few extra days after um, the date of the election if, if absentee ballots um, arrive and are not affirmatively postmarked. Um, post dating the election, they should be accepted. And that seems like a state law, and that was a construction by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court of state law. Why is that sitting in the, in the Supreme Court right now? What are we waiting for? And there's a concern, and this is gonna get us way into the weeds, but there is a concern that there is an issue embedded in that case that's reminiscent of Bush versus Gore, the concurring opinions there about the power of the state legislature under the US Constitution, and that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court arguably, and this is the claim that has been pressed in the Supreme Court right now, arguably infringed on state legislative power to set the rules for the election. And that's that case is sitting in the Supreme Court and there was a stay that was requested and we don't know right now why several weeks have gone by and we haven't heard from the court and the you know 
uh, talking heads will tell you that there's a big opinion coming, whether it's a dissenting opinion or not. That opinion could say that the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania overstepped its authority and can't even construe state law to require what's going on there. So we don't know what will happen, um, but that is just another place in which even the ability of state courts, state legislatures to create the rules could be infringed or limited by this, this conception. Now that is a, a recipe for um, uncertainty to say the least, I guess we'll call it that. Um, and with that, we are accumulating some questions in the Q&A chat. So Paul, if you'd like to, unless I'm, well, before I do that, are there any panelists who'd like to, to uh, say anything else relative to the trends they see in the election of 2020? Jonathan. Yeah, I, I just want to raise the issue of um, election security, cybersecurity related issues. Sure. Um, you know, one of the untold stories of this election cycle, and maybe I shouldn't be raising it, is that there has been a very robust collaboration between federal government agencies and, elect, uh, and existing state and local election systems to ensure that we're going to have a uh, secure, accessible, and accurate uh, electoral outcome and results. Um, that is something I actually spoke with uh, representatives from a firm here in Omaha that, that does this around the country and that they've been working very, very closely and they have the, you know, the internet security, the software and all of that. And that they actually are also working with the media and, and what's interesting about this is, you know, because they help them to report valid election results, is that um, what should we think that if indeed we get to a point at the end of the process and, um, you know, maybe the results are, are fairly clear to most of us, but given the ambiguity of a lot of things that we've been talking about, um, no one's willing yet to declare uh, a winner or that one of the, one of the candidates uh, would prefer not to concede defeat. Um, that's going to complicate these matters. Um, my hope is that the reporting is accurate, you know, that we have a reasonable assurance that all the votes are being counted. Now, granted, they probably will not be counted in their in com completely for about perhaps 10 or 20 days for some of the reasons that have already been suggested here. You know, that absentee ballots come in, come in late, they may be postmarked, but don't arrive on time and what have you. And so I just wanted to raise the specter of that because that's not nearly as positive as, and optimistic as a lot of the other things that I've been talking about, but I worry about this part of it as well. So I want yeah. to raise that issue. Thanks for raising that point. I have to say at a different, a different um, conference later on today, I'm actually going to be talking quite extensively about that. Um, and I share your um, concerns regarding what we do on November 3rd and afterwards and, and the, the lack of clarity that we might end up with on election day. I mean, I would say that there are some encouraging signs and some discouraging signs. And um, I guess I'll leave, leave it at that. Um, uh, Professor Katz and uh, Professor Whitka, if you care to, to uh, elaborate on that or Dr. Thomas in particular. Just very quickly, I was uh, checking in at the corner barbershop with, uh, I'm on speed dial. <laughs> and the feedback is that people are excited about voting, but many say they don't need to because they live in a blue state. That's right from the street corner. So, so therefore, things like ballot issues, they wouldn't weigh in on and other the down ballot thing they wouldn't weigh in on. So here's someone thinking, well, I live in a blue state. I don't need to. I think that motivation at that level, we really need to emphasize because they don't quite get into all the granular details that we're talking about, but that motivation is key. And I'm wondering if, if a then and now kind of analogy, then back when your great grandparents had to guess how many jelly beans were in a jar, and now the same thing, but here's what it looks like. They need to connect the dots of the suppression. They see it back in Jim Crow and slavery time. It's more nuanced now. And they need to know it's the same end result to stop you from having a voice. I think that could get people fired up to stand in those lines for however long it takes. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Thomas. I agree that that's about political communication by, by parties and by others who are interested in mobilizing people to exercise their, their rights. Um, uh, Chris, any comments before we go to the Q&A? No, no, I don't have any comments. Um, 
Okay, with that, over to you, Paul, and uh, if you have any questions from uh, our attendees. Yeah, thank you, David. And what I'd like to do is uh, we had some questions that came in when folks registered, and I'm, I want to go back and forth between uh, those questions and some great questions that we've gotten in the chat and Q&A. So um, first question is uh, mandatory voting with small fines for those who won't even turn in a blank ballot. Good, bad, ugly, question mark. So mandatory voting, that's a, uh, some people have called for that at um, the federal level. What do we think? Uh, Dr. Katz, if you could give us a legal sort of appreciation of that for <laughs> to set our context here. Yeah, I, um, it's not gonna happen here. Um, so in some ways I sort of feel like it's not part of our culture. Um, would it be a good idea? I don't know, we could have a proportional representation system in this country too. That might be a good idea too. And we could have central control over our school districts. We're not going down any of those had so um, I I would rather see a shift in not rather um, I think it would be more effective to sort of work through civics education as as um, weak as that might sound to sort of change the way people think and an understanding or at least encourage people to think that they're voting even in a state that's safe at the presidential level for one side or the other is is an important thing for people. Um, to do. I, I don't, I think it's actually one place where I don't think um, a, a federal state command is, is, is likely to survive scrutiny. And even if it did is necessarily, it's, it's never going to happen here. Um, so. Uh, anyone else? Jonathan? Yeah, it reminds me a lot. I, I've spent a lot of time in Cuba working and doing research. And it reminds me that because voting is mandatory, it's compulsory voting in, in Cuba. Um, and if you don't go to the polls, they send somebody from the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution to knock on your door at 7.30 <laughs> to ask you why you haven't voted. Um, I don't like this. I, I, I think that, you know, I, and I agree with Ellen that we really do need to kind of bolster our civics education to really kind of promote a much more robust uh, sensitivity to civic duty. Um, I just think that that's really missing in, 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 in huge chunks of our society today you know, it's not that people have to memorize the preamble of the Constitution, although that would be nice from my perspective. But I do think that it would be smarter of us if we had that be a, a more prominent feature of, of our, our political socialization and our broader education systems. Go ahead, Chris. And maybe more uh, civic education would also teach people that depriving others of their right to vote is not a good thing. So it would be killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> now that sounds like an efficient proposal. <laughs> oh, Paul, please go ahead. A question that went into our Q&A. Um, what is it about the history and evolution of voting in the United States that has made voter suppression such a prevalent and in many aspects accepted practice as opposed to how it is seen in other countries? Um, can, I guess I'll take a shot at that. I mean, I've, writ I've written a little bit on voter suppression in the U.S. and I, Voter suppression is pretty common. I mean, historically, it's been very common in lots of democracies. Um, most other countries, you know, in the last five decades or so, six decades, have, have put into place much greater um, protections for voting. I think there's also, you know, we have a two-party system. Um, so it makes suppressing voting a little bit more attractive, maybe. Whereas if, if you had other people and they were going to vote for maybe not the other party for sure, but maybe a third or fourth or fifth or sixth party, it becomes less important because you can have a plurality of seats and still have a role in government. I mean, so there's certain things about the American system which do make it particularly attractive to suppress voting. Then there's the, the racial divisions and uh, in the US and um, you know there were lots of attempts to suppress voting by immigrants in the north in the 1840s 1850s and things like that so I don't know about the research on this but it strikes me that people will probably be more willing to prevent voting by other racial and ethnic groups and certainly America has for a long time been a quite diverse country compared to 
you know, countries in Western Europe and things like that. So there's a lot of reasons why I think voter suppression is happening in America more so than in other affluent democracies at this time. I might, I might just add a thought, I agree with all of that, I guess I want one additional thought. Um, and that has to do, if you sort of just look at the history of voter suppression and particularly racial efforts to uh, prevent black people from voting in this country for so long, um, it's, there's sort of no way to understand it in terms of just its effect on the outcome of public policy. And it undeniably has that effect. But there were so many ways in which a minority community's voice could be um, neutralized while still allowing them to vote through districting, through other procedures where you could just outvote them in many places. And the relentlessness with which so many Southern jurisdictions in particular and not exclusively Southern jurisdictions pressed for black disenfranchisement, I think speaks to, I think a foundational understanding of the power of the vote mm -hmm. and the equalizing effect it has that everyone is in some sense equal in the voting box. And this is gonna sound saccharine, but ideas about dignity and equality of citizenship and something that happens when people vote that a lot of folks in this country tried to prevent um, others from obtaining. And I think that's a, it's a powerful narrative and it speaks to, I think some of the things a lot of folks here have already said about people should feel mobilized and insist on exercising that right because of um, this history and, and the like. But I do think it's a distinct understanding, frankly, of the power of the vote and the power of casting a ballot, even if it's not the decisive ballot in a particular race. Um, that that reflects the relentlessness with which it's been suppressed um, and continues to be limited. Um, Stephen, if I could ask you to sort of uh, elaborate on that from a particular perspective. Uh, after all, African Americans' belief in the ballot has survived a lot of um, the onerous barriers that Ellen just mentioned. Um, it was rewarded in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama, I suppose, uh, and it's had its setbacks. Um, what do you think about the Black community's um, continuing belief in the ballot and belief that active in the, activity in the public square is worth doing given the reversals that have been suffered periodically on this? Well, I, I think that we've seen some lions, some heroes like the John Lewis's and, and others who have passed away. They were that front line. They had the dogs sicked on them. They saw Bull Connor's whites of his eyes they, they were beaten while trying to exercise their right to vote. And in describing that experience back in that time period, it inspires us today. Now, uh, my parents tried to shield me from as much of that ugliness as possible. And we've tried to shield our, our nieces. And, okay, so now we're further removed from that, those events and we start taking it for granted. So I think it's, this administration has pointed out, you can't take it for granted. It's a wake up call for many people who thought that, well, what do you got to lose? Remember that line? Some people thought that in the community. Now they know four years can make a huge difference. And so for me, it's all about trust. I talked about those California boxes and characterized them as voter suppression. But in one of the chat boxes to us, it says here, why should we assume that an unofficial ballot box is voter suppression. I thought that was very interesting. The person goes on to say, well, you could have one of those boxes in a barbershop. Why, why would we assume it's voter suppression? The way the story played out, being controlled by the local Republican party made it feel that way to me. And so it was all about trust. But the person who wrote this comment has a very good point. Here's a tactic that is neutral on its surface but how it's used could be, could lead to the disenfranchisement we're talking about. If our communities are not kind of part of this conversation, they're totally confused. So let's take this one step further, this suggestion. If I put a collection box for ballots in the barbershop and said, I'll turn these in for you, is that some, in other words, some of the tactics we're seeing on the other side in the name of voter suppression, would we use them in the name of voter enfranchisement? Or are they just off the board, off the table altogether as inappropriate? 
I just need to know, like, what are the rules of the road under these circumstances? Can we use social media to amplify, even if it's not fully true, to get, you know what I mean? What are the rules now? Because norms have been broken and, and people don't know now where the lines are over which that's inappropriate. I think that's a real issue right now and one that uh, we need to have a more robust conversation about because this perception that, oh, it happens on both sides, I don't think so. And it puts race, once again, back at the center of mm -hmm. the fault line. Mm -hmm. From why do we have the electoral college and what we go back to Jim Crow. And so we're back to the issue of race. And W. E. Du Bois told us way back then that the problem of the 20th century, now it's a problem of the 21st century, is a problem of the color line. We thought that was behind us, David, because of what you just said, the election of Barack Obama. I remember we're in post-racial society. Remember that, Chris? <laughs> we're in a post-racial society. And in the communities and neighborhoods where I am, they call this white lash. The backlash, what we, the current administration is a reaction to that. So race remains front and center we have to deal with it. Well said. Um, Paul, over to you. Uh, another question from one of our registrants. Um, have you considered the possibility of a, la a last week of October surprise announcement from the Justice Department on some alleged illegal activities conducted by the Biden campaign? What legal means, if any, could the campaign take to have these alleged charges decided prior to the election? <laughs> I'm not sure. Helen, please, our, our legal mind. <laughs> I guess I, I, I'm not sure what, what the questions, what that, you know, it would depend on what's being alleged and what laws are. I just don't know. I, I can't sort of respond to that based on. I, I guess, I mean, when I heard that question, I envisioned something like, um, you know, a late um, announcement, an investigation had been opened or something, sort of the 2016 version of, of what. You mean emails have been found? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Any thoughts, anyone on the panel? I'm not sure if that's a legal question or a political question. But... I just know during uh, 2016, I had a lawyer, Ellen, um, move into our house. We opened up our home and I was so impressed that that organizations send lawyers on the ground to simply observe the process. I think our communities need to know that. There are people on the ground to support your enfranchisement, to protect your right to vote, and to deal with legal issues that come up at a polling station. And this lawyer, pro bono, traveled across yeah. Pennsylvania within a jurisdiction to take care of those kinds of things. I think that's great, but a lot of people don't know and so when they show up and there are militia there, unofficial poll watchers, I think we need to prepare them for, again, um, that appearance of intimidation and remind them that their great grandparents walked through police lines and had dogs sicked on them. Not that bad, but the outcome is an attempt to have the same kind of negative outcome. We have to remind them we've been here and we have successfully addressed these kinds of barriers. I'm hopeful because if we have an overwhelming response, some of these things won't matter. It'll be in the margins. It's when it's close, that is what gives me the greatest concern. So I want those people thinking that, oh, I live in a blue state, I don't need to show up. Yeah, you need to show up. And the same would go for people who say, I'm in a red state, I don't need to show up. I'm drawing I, on that voter protection is a big issue um, this fall. I know that, um, candidates or a variety of offices, uh, and at least one political party has better protection um, teams either working already or deployable um, if, if things happen. Would you, Ellen, or anyone on the panel, um, project that to be a significant level of activity on election day and immediately afterwards, or do you expect that to recede? I mean, it's sort of unknowable. I, I agree with the sentiment, like, you know, if it's close, this is obviously more difficult and these issues matter more. 
um, you know, where there are wide margins, these sorts of fights over specific questions become less less crucial. So it's sort of hard to it's hard to answer that um, um, in the abstract. There, there is a um, a number of uh, community based organizations throughout the Midwest who are in the process of training poll observers. So, and, and they're taking volunteers from the community. They don't have to necessarily be attorneys. It'd be great if they were, but what they're teaching, what they're, what they're you know, providing workshops and teaching them on what particular things are, are required of both people who are able, you know, going to vote, but then people who are there merely observing how far they can actually be. And there's really, really robust regulations and rules for all poll workers anyway, as to who can be inside the polls, what rights that those individuals have. I mean, you can't wear a, a candidate t-shirt to go vote in most states, uh, you have to put something on over it. And so there, there are things in place already. You know, um, I, I think we need to think of this from the perspective that the estimates are that 152 million people will vote in this election, which is you know, 14 million more than voted in 2016. And it'll probably be a higher turnout. So the idea here is how can we ensure that all votes will be ca um, cast and counted appropriately? But to Stephen's point, it is an issue of trust. You know, I mean, trust is confidence in the system and reliability upon it, but it has to be demonstrated over time. So there's a lot of ambiguity in that right now. And I, and I think legitimately we should be concerned as to whether or not the system can be trusted, especially given the erosion of, of so many of the laws and policies and procedures that were put in place exactly to address the questions that are being raised in this panel. So, um, you know, when I was optimistic earlier, I was mostly optimistic about Nebraska. I wasn't talking about the whole country at that point in time, but I actually still feel, I feel good. I still believe that, you know, there are elements of the democracy that, that will hold in the face of so many of the things that we're talking about here. And people need reminders that can be non nonpartisan reminders. And however we can do it, just like with my mask, <laughs> just, <laughs> And I was walking by a restaurant, the, the pizza box, all white pizza box and on the outside of the box it simply said vote. I think it's that simple a message, not telling you how to vote, just vote. And reminding people constantly that it's coming up. A lot of people have turned off, get them turned back in, in everyday activities. Um, Paul, another question? Yeah, from the chat, a question um, and an observation. There seems to be a paradox happening. Voting is the ultimate way to have your voice heard and simultaneously is a right being systematically attacked. Is there any hope? Because it doesn't sound like the future of voting rights is looking good. Um, anyone on the panel like to take that for us? <laughs> I'd like to talk to that person. And again, I, you know, this notion of let me tell you what the world was like when you couldn't vote. Or let me tell you how the world changed when more people got the right to vote. Um, I like to think that things have been worse when I look back at those history books and see the people beaten and attacked by dogs and the, and the National Guard coming out and protecting the demonstrators, protecting the people trying to vote, protecting the people desegregating universities and schools. I remember that time, that's my mental map. And so I'd like to think that those kind of core supports are still there, even in the midst of the uncertainty that we face right now. So I'm an eternal optimist and simply want to, this is a, this is a good civics lesson for us all. And I'm hoping that after November 3rd, we don't stop rebuilding the infrastructure for civic engagement. A lot of my young people, I don't want to criticize them too much, but they really don't fully appreciate or fully understand the process. We were ta we've taken it for granted. We've taken it for granted that we will always go forward. We won't go backwards. And that's no guarantee. Yeah, I would, I would say too, I mean, if you're feeling pessimistic and there are certainly reasons for pessimism, I mean, I think it, it's the case. And I've looked at at least state level laws over time going back a hundred years. I mean, it's, 
laws make it's easier to vote now than it was pretty much at any time in American history. There's more ways to vote. Just the fact that we're talking about early voting and lines for early voting. Well, states didn't have early voting, you know, 50, 40 years ago. Um, in certain states, you know, it's uneven. So in certain states like Oregon, you have things like automatic voter registration, universal vote by mail. And it's, you know, that's about as easy as it gets. And certainly that's not the case in every state, but there's been a lot of progress throughout, you know, the last several decades in terms of voting rights. And we do need to keep that in mind, but we also need to just be vigilant. Like you said, Stephen, we need to be vigilant that these it's never permanent. There's, there's always going to be, or not always, but there are going to be times where there's going to be incentives to try to suppress voting. And we need to recognize that and we need to be alert to it and we need to be fighting it. Um, Ellen or Jonathan, any comments before we move on? You know, one of the things I'm always reminded of in 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, there were six elected black officials in the House of Representatives. I think there's six, almost 60 today. You know, um, is it is it a representative number in terms of proportion? That's not a, ra a rabbit hole that I want to go down, but what it, it does signal that there has been progress. Um, there is a very robust and growing number of Latino elected officials in the United States and women and people from the LGBTQIA community. So I do see there a growing diversity among our elected officials. And I do believe that that is really anchored in, in the expansion and the protection of voting rights. And so for me, I become very covetous of making sure that those those rights remain in place, you know. Um, I also serve as the state director for our U.S. Uh, Commission on Civil Rights Advisory Committee here in Nebraska. So, you know, the abrogation of citizens' rights are are really one of the things that I really, you know, cling to very desperately because they're always under assault, you know. And I think in this instance, I think to Ellen's points that she made earlier at the outset of the conversation, you know, it, it is concern because it has been a, you know, a slow erosion of those rights. It didn't happen in one fell swoop. I mean, there were a number of rulings over the course of the last 15 years in particular that made 2013 occur. You know, and I remember with my Latino political science friends across the country, you know, we all immediately threw up our hands and rolling around on the floor, it, like the, the sky was falling, you know? Now granted, you know, we've been able to kind of calm our fears a little bit, but they're still there. I guess maybe I'll just add the, I mean, I think if you look over history in this country, it isn't a sort of trajectory of constant growth and expansion of the franchise. It's cyclical, there's ups and downs, great gains are, are made, and then there's been retrenchment. Um, and just to be that broken record, we've seen an increase in, um, you know, minority representatives in Congress at the local level, um, because of law and because of the Voting Rights Act in particular. And the 1982 amendments to the Voting Rights Act changed the face. And if you just, at my class this morning, we were talking about some of these cases and you look at, you see in, in federal cases from the eighties and the nineties, this kind of relentless, the first African-American candidate to Congress or the first African-American candidate to the school board since reconstruction. Um, and that language came because the Voting Rights Act had power and was enforced in ways by the Justice Department and by federal courts. Um, so I, I don't know what the bottom line is that we have to keep fighting, but that the, the cycle is not, is not relentlessly towards more expansion. Um, and we've seen significant retractions in the last, um, in retrenchments in the last, in the last decade in particular. So eternal vigilance, I suppose, um, being um, one thing that's required and perhaps a little bit of activism by those who are in Congress or in the executive who are in a place to um, take some action. Um, Paul, please. From a registrant, for presidential elections, would abolishing the Electoral College improve turnout? Would individual voters affiliated with their state's minority party feel more as if their vote counted? Um, anyone? Mm -hmm. Let me just, for uh, context, I didn't fully appreciate the whole, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a political scientist, but I didn't fully appreciate the whole electoral college issue until it got brought up in 
most recent election. And as I looked at it, I saw this link back to slavery once again, back to Jim Crow once again. So here's my question. Is it, and then there are arguments, no, that is not related to slavery. It's not related to Jim Crow. It's related to something completely non-racial. I got confused. Is the Electoral College, its origins, its roots, its DNA, tied up in the history of racial suppression in this country? Is that its origins? Is that its birthplace? And if the answer is yes, then I have an answer to your question about the Electoral College. If it's no, then I know, I know I need to do more homework. Anybody? Personally, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I know the <clears throat> states' rights, part, you know, part of the reason why people were very concerned about states' rights in writing the Constitution was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. And of course, the Electoral College was one means of protecting states' rights. But I'm not sure of the, you know, how strongly those two things were linked in the minds of the people who wrote the Constitution are in the debates. I, I'm not sure. We'd have to get a few historians to argue about it on here, I think. Um, Ellen, please go ahead. <laughs> I have an opinion on this, not a particular fact. The thing with the Electoral College is not, is not new. Um, it's been going on for a long time. And the structure of the Electoral College reflects um, the structure of the Senate in, in, in you know, because it, it replicates the po population imbalances that that does. It was part of an original understanding to give smaller states more of a voice. Um, and obviously there's different elements to, to that. Um, you know, right back with like mandatory voting, um, are we gonna scrap the electoral college? You know, are we gonna amend the constitution to get rid of that in some, some way? Mm -hmm. There are various proposals, you know, uh, compacts among states that would pledge to uh, align their electors with the popular vote in the state um, or to, you know, di different ways to, um, to go about it. The, the perennial could, could a state just assign its electors irrespective of how <coughs> the state vote went. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I hope we won't, won't see that kind of fight because it's not gonna be pretty if that's what, what this is gonna devolve to in the next, you know, next few weeks. Um, do we need, so I, I don't have a solution to, to the, that, that problem among many things I don't have solutions to. <laughs> Ellen, do you think it's a rabbit hole that we just live with it, but it's not worth the energy of what it would take to overturn? I don't know what it looks like. Um, you know, the, the, the compacts that would allocate the votes never, it don't, don't go past a certain point in terms of states signing on um, to them. There's litigation about faithless electors and the like. It's not my area of focus. Um, I don't, you know, solutions that involve let's amend the constitution are, you know, um, sure, um, you know, we could do lots of things. Um, it, it seems a little unlikely that, that we're able to, that, that that's gonna be a viable way of moving forward um, in, in, you know, and what that looks like. So a non-answer. Um, just let me sort of add a complication to the mix that the broad, the unrepresentativeness or the alleged unrepresentativeness of the Congress in terms of um, which parties get the most votes versus which parties get seats in the Congress is an issue already. Um, and the outcome of the last election and Bush v. Gore, of course, in the year 2000, showed this dissonance between popular vote outcomes and electoral vote outcomes that could be becoming more frequent. And that is a certainly a challenge to the legitimacy of the way we, we choose our leaders. So, um, and like Ellen, I don't think there's any simple solutions to this. And, Amending the Constitution, whatever its merits, is not a quick, painless process. So um, time will tell, I suppose. Um, Jonathan or or Chris, would you have a comment? Well, I, I mean, I think it would be great if the Electoral College were abolished, and I would go, I would go one further and say abolish the Senate as well. They're, they're not really defensible in, in, in modern democracies. It's not, they're not really defensible institutions, I don't think. Um, but yeah, I would agree they're not likely to happen. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be maybe trying to long-term educate people um, about the problems associated with this. And I do think it creates, 
you know, when you have a situation, even now Trump's not looking good in the polls. I think everybody agrees he has virtually no chance of winning the popular vote, like basically none. He has a good, not a good chance, but he has a, a chance of winning the electoral college, you know? And if that keeps happening repeatedly, that is gonna create incredible unrest eventually. I mean, at some point, people are going to get really mad that they're going out and voting for the president and the person they're choosing is losing every time because of the electoral college. So long term, it's something that is going to be highly problematic for uh, peace in our society, I think, if we don't figure out a way to address that issue. So I would make, yeah, it's not going to happen quickly, but we need to educate people, raise the issue. And I mean, in my opinion, we getting rid of the electoral college is absolutely essential. I would, I would concur that it's very problematic, probably not going to happen in my time. You know, if think of just the case of California, 40 million people, uh, they have two senators and you've got 14 other states with 40 million people and they've got, you know, 28 senators. Is there, a, is there, is, is how equal is that? You know, it's not. And so overwhelmingly the sense of those 28, those 14 states, you know, basically rules out California. Now, maybe people want to have it that way, but uh, I don't see it fair or equitable. And so it does, the system has to figure out a way to accommodate our new reality. You know, the, these are 200 plus year old institutions that need to be mo modernized. It's as simple as that. So on that consensus point, Paul, um, any other any other yeah, questions? we got a few others, um, and we have about 15 minutes, so we can, if um, all of our panelists are willing to stay on for the full two hours, we can get a, maybe a couple more of these in. Um, beyond just a federal holiday, it's clear civic education is lacking. Are grassroots activists and organizers, including long-term solutions that include implementing robust civic education in our local political school or public school systems? Yeah, I'm going to jump at that one because um, actually, as a as a political scientist, this is one of my pet peeves with American society: the fact that we leave this to chance, that we haven't had a more kind of uh, formal means of both, you know, uh, articulating and inculcating the values that underlie our 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 system of governance. Um, and at the at the end of the day we pay for it in spades. We're paying for it right now because we have a population that is largely both ignorant and unaware uh, of the impact of how our political system works and how it functions within their lives. And I'll just give you an anecdote. Um, but in the 2016 election, there was a, a pro-Trump rally um, that I attended. I like to go to see just as a observer how these things shake out. And there was a woman with a sign that said, Keep your government hands off my social security. You know, and yes, it's laughable, but at the same time, it's pathetic. It's pathetic to, to think that for a, something that we've had in place for over 75 years, that people don't have any connection to how that, that, that got into their lives and what role that that plays and the role that our government plays in offering support for that and then their contributions to it. And so, you know, I think that that just is a, it's a small, like I say, example, but I think it really speaks directly to the point of us needing to have, and for us to rely on civic organizations to, to inculcate those values, they should operate in parallel and obviously support it. But I think in our public education system, it has to be one of the core things that we teach and we're not doing it. We're, or if we're trying, we're doing a very poor job. Um, anyone else on the panel have a comment on that? I'll just add, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not one to come out against civic education. I think, you know, everyone, it's hard to say like, oh, that would be a bad idea. Um, I always, every time I, when that comes up, I do have a feeling like that's just not going to be good enough. And it is, it is such a, it's an important tool. It's a necessary tool, but it isn't just a lack of education or misinformation that's got us gotten us into the mess that we're in and while and you know and actually i think i think young voters and young people generally are actually doing a superb job right now of demanding change and being engaged and trying to do things from you know environment to gun rights to you know you know name a whole bunch of issues that the that, that young people are engaged on and they're the ones who are signing up to be poll workers and to 
get out the vote and all of that. So, I mean, I think, so I'm not disagreeing with any of that. I just think civics education can only get us so far and that we do need, you know, major legal reform to make voting easier and more accessible. And, you know, the tools that have been successful in the past need to be reinforced and bolstered. Um, just on that issue, before we move on to something else, I would say that in addition to education, there is um, the public square and the kind of messages that are exchanged um, on political topics between both civil society and uh, centers of, of authority, of expertise, that is not as open as it used to be either. And it's not open because it's not more closed because people are prevented from speaking. It's actually becoming more closed because of the number of people speaking who are not interested in sort of civil, civil discourse. Um, and that there is an issue of the overlap between education, communications, and the kind of civic discourse that might correlate with the, a healthy democracy that we probably need to start worrying about. Don't really have a solution as to how to improve things, but just a, an observation of the conditions we are in. Oh, I think you bring the fairness doctrine back and that solves half of the problem right there, but you know. Um, but implementing the fairness doctrine on Facebook might be difficult. <laughs> right, that, like <laughs> that horse left the barn. <laughs> so. For David and Ellen, you know, when we look back at the moments that led us to the Voting Rights Act, there were struggles. In fact, I wouldn't be too over the board to say there was blood in the streets. Let's fast forward now. I guess, you know, do we need that kind of critical, somehow visual, whatever it was that broke the dam and we passed that legislation with great fanfare? Do we need that same kind of visible in the street, blood in the street, um, visible evidence? You see what I'm trying to get to right now? Is it just an intellectual exercise? Back then, people saw people being beaten and they were in outrage and they rose up and said things will change. Do we need that same level of, or can we do it by persuasion and argument and logic? I'm looking at my Hollywood squares of value. Um, Ellen, if you want to go, I have an answer for that, but I'm the, I'm the, I'm the host. I, mean, I guess just two points that, are, that may or may not be responsive. You know, tens of thousands of people took to the streets this spring and this summer, um, and and you know, I'm demanding substantive change on issues that matter critically to people's lives. And there were a lot of young people who had that bad civic education who, nevertheless, were out there um, in I think immensely powerful ways. So I think we have it, and it's happening. Um, and it's a question whether that's going to translate into you know votes, and they're going to be counted in a procedure that. Um, you know, will affect some of the things that people want. I just wanted to add, um, you know, Jonathan mentions the fairness, the fairness auction and one, one fairness doctrine. One of the things we haven't discussed is campaign finance reform um, or the massive displacement of the entire campaign finance apparatus in this country in the last 15 years, Citizens United 15 years, um, 12 years, um, Citizens United onward and the, the, the are there a lot more voices? Maybe, maybe not. There's it, it, the, the the political discourse, the way we hear issues, the way we discuss political issues. You know, the the, the role of money in the system and whose voices are being amplified and where is really difficult. And I, again, I won't say that I have a solution to that problem, but the notion that the what we have right now is a working viable system, I think, is really hard to subscribe to. Um, that's. Better said than anything I could add. I guess I'd just say that um, if we we did obviously have and still do have many people in the streets for for good causes and people are activists um, and they are motivated. Um, over to the law and <laughs> the Congress to uh, bring that consistency. After all, in the sixties there were legally legal there was legal progress and action in addition to uh, demonstrations and those two forces together probably. Um, what might correlate with real change if we achieve that. Um, Paul, I think we're running close to the clock here. Yeah, so many good questions still um, remain. I wanna to try to address as many people who've um, asked and then try to do it in chronological order. So I'm gonna uh, apologize if we don't get to all of these questions. Um, in the chat uh, question, in the absence of a federal national standard, is there a benchmark 
among the states for who has gotten it right? Well, I think uh, Oregon would be the place to look. And I, I just recently saw a paper. It's, uh, I have it right up here. It's by um, Scott Schraufnagel, Michael Pomante, and Quan Lee. It's called The Cost of Voting in the American States 2020. It's in the Election Law Journal. So I recommend you check that out. And it kind of has a bunch of laws and they rank the states in Oregon does early voting, does automatic voter registration, same day voter registration, doesn't require photo ID, you know, on all this stuff. So, and that's one thing we haven't talked about is, yeah, there's definitely a need for federal action. And there's certain states that are really actively trying to suppress voting. But then there's other states where, you know, there, it might be possible at the state level to get laws to ease voting. New York, for instance, my home state, um, they've been trying to do automatic voter registration there because you have you have Democrats uh, in charge of of both chambers of the legislature and the governorship. And there's other states. Um, you mentioned the ballot initiative, Stephen. There's places where that could work to expand voting rights, to get uh, automatic voter registration, same day voter registration, and things like that. So. People who are in particular states that have the initiative should be looking at that as a, as a possible route to get uh, voting rights expanded. So Chris, do you think that the, the, um, the mud of fraud that's being thrown at the whole process, do you think it will stick? Or do you think that we'll get through the, the misinformation um, yeah, I, I think it's very polarized, you know, I, I, I mean, the people know that, I mean, I think objectively experts agree that there is not actually a huge problem with voter fraud in the United States of America, but there's people who consume certain media that believe that it's a huge problem. And I just saw polling on this today, even among Republicans, it's like se over 70% who watch Fox news think that voting fraud is, is, is a huge problem. But among the rest of the Republicans, it's down like 40%. So even, you know, there's certain people who, who watch Fox News, listen to certain politicians and believe it's a huge problem, but the rest of the country doesn't. But those people are not are not insignificant number. So there's that belief out there that fraud is a huge problem. And there are certain things, I think like voter ID. I mean, if you put that up for a, a vote, I think it would pass in a lot of states. People like the idea a lot of people like the idea of voter ID and they don't necessarily understand how it disenfranchises certain people or some of them may very well understand how it disenfranchises certain people. So some of it, it just, you gotta go state by state, look at public opinion and see how things are. Look at if you have the initiative and, and see what you can do. Thanks. I'm just building on that question, um, to see if I can canvas uh, the panel's view of the following proposal. If uh, post-election, whatever the outcome, uh, the Congress decided to launch a commission on voting and on election administration, would you think that that would be a good venue for, um, you know, compiling a list of those things that work and those things that don't and a sort of an action agenda to, for improvement? Or is that, or is our partisan divide too great for that to be useful? Well, I think, I think um, they can't, we kind of know what, I think we all kind of know what needs to be done, right? I don't think we need to do too much in, in the way of studying. I think it's just a question of putting the people in power who want to protect voting rights. Um, and that's going to be the trick. I mean, there's certainly things we don't know. We don't know about how certain provisions of law work and it might be more valuable to study that and all that. But I think there's a lot of things that we do know, and we know that there's barriers being put up and, and, and there's things that we know that would reduce those barriers. So it's more a question of political will than knowledge at this point, I think. Do you think that uh, the polarization will write itself? Right, right now, as the narrative has gone, we are, in my own mind, could be my misunderstanding, assuming that conservatives Republicans don't want want to suppress, don't want it open, 
do you think that the reckoning, we won't know for sure until we're on the other side of the reckoning, but that the reckoning will kind of right the ship and both parties will recognize that the way forward is inclusion and diversity or more polarization? Uh, you know, I'm not really optimistic on that front. Um, I wish I could be, but I, in, in, my, in my 50 plus years, I did not ever expect that I'd be having these types of a conversation as to, you know, really having to live through something that I thought that we perhaps were getting towards something more <laughs> post-racial, right? Wasn't that the perception that we had with uh, the election of, of President Barack Obama? Correct. But, but, but I'm, I'm, so I've been knocked off my feet. I've been knocked back a little bit by what we're going through right now. And my hope is that, and I've been trying to, you know, in, in conversation with students and other folks in my university community, is that we probably have to try to see if we can't let the better angels of our nature guide us as we go through this. And to try to engender, you know, more genuine conversation, to try to understand why people are so vehemently opposed on the basis of race and gender to other folks. There's lots of reasons why that's going on, you know, and, and we've just not had, you know, that public square. We've not, we don't know how to engage in that any longer. And my hope is that perhaps with a reckoning that we can begin to have those types of conversations, but I, it's not going to be an easy conversation, mm -hmm. not by any stretch of the imagination. Anyone else on that topic? Um, I just volunteer that, um, the reckoning, as as you you put it, uh, Stephen, um, is coming, but it'll be a disputed reckoning because of how divided we are when we when we hit November third and whatever comes afterwards. Um, you know, the division of opinion and perspective beyond racism is so deep that one wonders um, how we put back put the uh, toothpaste back in the tube or whatever the metaphor is one chooses. Um, Think of the, um, the, deba the debate after our Supreme Court justice is seated, for example. Um, think of the, the likely partisan calls for response in the Democratic Party should that occur and should the Democratic Party take control of the Senate along with the White House. Um, that would be a reckoning of a kind, but it wouldn't be a reckoning that would necessarily bring us together as a country. So, wow. It's, um, it's tough to see how this simplifies it and clarifies itself quickly after November 3rd. And Paul, I think we're coming towards the end. We're at two o'clock. Okay. Well, that so, went too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, let me first thank each of our panelists for um, a really enjoyable conversation on some fairly tough issues. Thanks for for taking the time and thanks for thinking deeply about these, these challenges that confront us all just two weeks before um, the election. And um, we will be circulating a summary. I'm not sure how you summarize this discussion exactly, but we'll be circulating a summary to you to see if we can capture any closing thoughts you might have. But thank you again. And thank you, Paul, for hosting this, this panel and this series. Thank you, David, for moderating. This is really a great um, way to conclude this series. It's been really interesting to learn and uh, to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye bye.